Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on the Safety Risk Register in Action. I'm Stuart Mater, and I lead the Public Transportation Agency Safety Program, or PTAS, Technical Assistance Center within FTA's Office of Transit Safety and Oversight. We're also joined by Andrew Lofton, a contractor supporting FTA's PTAS Technical Assistance Center. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to type your questions into the Q&A box. FTA will review these questions and will provide answers at the end of our formal presentation. These slides and a recording of this webinar will be available on the PTAS PAC website resource library within a couple of days after the conclusion of this webinar. During today's webinar, we will demonstrate how agencies can use a safety risk register to track hazards and mitigations. As we'll mention several times throughout today's webinar, FTA does not require agencies to use a safety risk register as your method of documentation. Our goal is that after this presentation, you'll be able to describe ways to document and manage information from safety risk management and safety assurance activities, identify methods to prioritize hazards, to include in the safety risk register and in other forms of documentation, and to describe how to use documentation tools over time to show how your agency has assessed safety risk implemented mitigations, and measured the effectiveness of those mitigations. We're pleased to be joined today by Jared Garcia, Manager of Safety for the San Diego Metropolitan Transit System. And we'll hear from Jared a little later in the presentation. And I'll now turn it over to Andy Lofton to go over the agenda for today. Andy, floor is yours. Stuart, thank you so much. And um, again, my name is Andy Lofton, contractor supporting FTA's PTASP Technical Assistance Center. In our agenda for today's webinar, um, so after this introduction phase, we're going to move right into our webinar content for the day. And today, of course, we're focused on documenting and managing safety risk management, or SRM, and safety assurance, or SA, information. And so to do that, we're going to walk through a few examples. And we're also going to provide participants with some considerations for how they can address the documentation requirements from the PTAS regulation. And then, as we do with all of our PTAS TAC webinars, we've reserved time at the end of the webinar for a question and answer session. Um, we have a couple people standing by that are going to be collecting questions throughout the webinar. So if you hear us say something, if you see something on the slide that you have a question about, um, perhaps during our, our, our industry participant today and, and during his presentation, if you have a question for him, right when you have that question, go ahead and ask it through the Q&A pod in your Zoom application. And we have some folks that are queuing all of those up and we'll use all the time we have today to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Also, before we get started, I wanna talk a little bit about related resources. Um, FTA has published an entire library of resources related to the PTAS regulation. Um, included in that information is an entire section on safety risk management, topic that we'll be hitting on today. Also, there's an entire section on safety assurance. Um, so by visiting the PTAS TAC resource library, you can find a lot of additional content, a lot of additional tools and information related to those two topics. Also, we understand that participants may have questions about the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now, FTA has established a website which contains FAQs and other information about the bipartisan infrastructure law and the related requirements. Um, if you have any questions about the bipartisan infrastructure law, we encourage you to visit that website, which is on your screen right now. And I think we'll have someone place that in the chat so it'll be a little more clickable for you. If you don't see the information that you're looking for through that website, we also would encourage you to contact FTA through an inbox FTA has set up just for this topic. And that's FTA-IIJA at DOT.gov. You send in a question there, FTA can review it and get back to you as soon as possible. And with that, I'm actually gonna hand the microphone back over to Stuart, and he's gonna talk to us a little bit about our feedback process. Stuart. Thanks, Andy. We wanna take just a minute to thank everybody for uh, continuing to provide us feedback, filling out the surveys uh, that we share at the end of webinars. We instituted these uh, earlier this year and the feedback you've been providing is incredibly valuable. It helps us develop and deliver these resources and tools 
uh, that are most relevant to your needs. And as you've seen, uh, we're continuing to evolve the webinar format based on your feedback. So you'll hear from more industry voices, more voices, including industry speakers. You'll hear from Jared Garcia uh, shortly. Um, and these industry speakers are offering uh, insight and perspective uh, that we think it's valuable for you to hear from a peer perspective and be able to ask questions of your peers as well. Uh, we've also integrated audience polls at three key points throughout the webinar. You'll see that again today. It gives you opportunities to contribute to the presentation and gives us valuable insight that we can incorporate in uh, as we as we prevent, present on the topic. And at the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll see another survey uh, when you leave the webinar. Uh, that survey will appear for you, and we look forward to your feedback on the changes. And now let's turn to the first audience poll. And for that poll, we'd like to get a sense of uh, your level of confidence uh, in your agency's ability to demonstrate uh, that it's documenting and monitoring the outputs of SRM and SA processes. So you'll see that survey appear on your screen momentarily. And uh, as soon as you answer that, I'll uh, we'll turn it back over to Andy to continue with the presentation. All right, thank you, Stuart. And thanks to all of our participants already engaging today. And as we can see from the results of our poll that um, the majority of our participants today are either very confident in how they document and monitor the outputs of SRM and SA or somewhat confident. So we have a very confident bunch with us today and that's great. And then we have some other folks as we can see that maybe are looking for a little bit more information and that's great. And so even those of us that are confident, we know how we do it at our agency, hopefully every one of our participants can benefit from some of the considerations we're going to talk about today. So thank you all for your participation in our first poll. And with that, let's move forward. And again, we're going to cover documenting and managing SRM and SA information. Now let's start with the requirement, right? The PTAS regulation requires agencies to have a way or a method to assess safety risk, to determine whether or not a mitigation is necessary as a result of that safety risk assessment. And then of course, a way to move forward with that decision, implementation of that mitigation. Now the regulation also requires the transit agencies maintain documents related to its agency safety plan, including documents related to how it implements its safety management system, or its SMS. And of course, your SMS includes your SRM and SA processes. So the requirement is to document the outputs, the results of your SRM and SA activities. Now, of course, the rule, as we've all heard, is very flexible, right? And that means that FDA has not specified a specific way that agencies have to follow to document these results. So in today's webinar, we're really gonna focus and explore one method that a lot of transit agencies have, have used to meet this documentation requirement, and that's a safety risk register. And again, this is one tool that agencies could use to meet the documentation requirements. So first question you might have is, what is a safety risk register? A very simple description would be a database for information related to a hazard. Database might be a loaded word for some of us. We might think of something very overly complicated and structured. It really can be as something as simple as a flat, an Excel spreadsheet, a flat file of information that combines relevant information about a hazard in one location. And so in this case, we're gonna talk about an, an Excel sheet that includes all of this information related to a hazard. Now through the fields that an agency may capture in this uh, safety risk register spreadsheet, we could imagine the flow of information through our different SMS activities. Right? For example, our employee safety reporting program could inform 
SRM and SA activities and might be documented in a safety risk register. Safety promotion, right? The training results and, and activities we're doing for safety promotion might inform the safety risk register. And the information in that safety risk register might inform our safety promotion activities. And same for safety assurance. We could imagine where, think about our safety assurance activities, monitoring our safety risk mitigations, for example. So we could see how that safety risk register might define those mitigations, might document them and inform our safety assurance activities. And maybe the results of that monitoring could be documented back in our safety risk register. So, so ultimately this safety risk register, again, one option, one way in which agencies can document SMS, specifically SRM and SA related activities can be a very, very valuable way to capture all that information in one place. And as a result, can be a valuable source of information for all of your SMS processes. Well, what do we normally put in a safety risk register? Right? Let's recall that safety risk registers are not a required documentation tool. So what we put in them might vary from one agency to another. Um, so agency A, their safety risk register might look one way. Agency B might, might have different information that it's capturing. One thing that we generally can think of being included in our safety risk register is the hazard. And of course, the related, the potential consequences. And just as a, as a quick recap on what we mean by those two things, and I'm sure those of you participated in our webinars to date may be very familiar with this, but the hazard, right? We're thinking about the condition that could re result in something bad and the potential consequences, that bad thing that could happen as a result of the condition, the hazard. Well, what else would a safety risk register? What else could it include? Well, it might include our safety risk ratings. And we talk about that, we're thinking about the results from our safety risk assessment, right? So we know the PTAS regulation requires us to assess safety risk in terms of likelihood and severity. And by using those two, those two pieces, we get a composite of a, of a safety risk rating or safety risk index. And so typically a safety risk register might, might contain what is that rating for safety risk that we assess. It also may contain information on what we believe that safety risk rating will be after we've implemented a mitigation that we've identified to help reduce the safety risk. Might include imp uh, implementation information. And what we're referring to here is implementation of these mitigations that the agency has identified and has begun to implement to help address that safety risk. So thinking about things like what are we going to do with this mitigation? What's being done? Who's going to do it and when? A safety risk register is a very useful place to capture that type of information. And also, once a mitigation has been developed, has been implemented, very important piece of SMS, central to safety assurance. How do we know it's working? How do we know that we're getting the return on safety on our safety investment? And so that's safety performance monitoring. Agencies may identify, for example, indicators and targets that will indicate to the agency whether or not this mitigation is achieving its intended outcome, whether or not it's moving this assessed safety risk from a level that may be unacceptable to an agency to a level that is acceptable. So again, all of these things are, are, are items that could be identified and tracked in a safety risk register. Now, to help discuss safety risk register, we need an example, right? We want a topic to walk through to show how an agency could leverage something like a safety risk register in practice. And so the example we're gonna work through today is, is an example of transit worker assault. And obviously this is an issue that impacts all transit agencies. And it could be an issue that's impacting transit agencies even if you've yet to record an actual transit worker assault, whether or not you've experienced it yet. So during today's webinar, we're gonna follow the flow of a potential consequence related to transit worker assault. And we're gonna take it through the SRM and SA process and we're gonna use a safety risk register 
That's kind of this foundation of documentation that we'll, we'll use as we move through that process. And hopefully that can be a good demonstration of how you could use a safety risk register, obviously not just for transit worker assault, but for other safety concerns, other hazards that are identified at your transit agency. So let's get started with our transit worker assault example. And we do wanna pause for one second and be completely honest, we're gonna pause a couple of times to provide this caveat. Now, Stuart mentioned it once already. I believe I may have mentioned it once, but as a reminder, safety risk register is not a requirement of the PTAS regulation, right? It is one method that it, transit agencies may opt to use to satisfy the SMS documentation requirements. Okay, and, and as we'll see, it, it's one of maybe different, many different useful methodologies you could implement to actually address these requirements. Again, not required, but maybe useful. So in our example, we always use our hypothetical transit agency our fictional straight line transit. And in our example today, the safety department at straight line transit is reviewing reports that have been submitted through straight line transit's employee safety reporting program. And they're reviewing it during its, it, a monthly safety meeting that it, it holds every month. And they do this to identify emerging safety trends within the agency. Now, during their most recent safety meeting, they've noticed something. And what they've noticed is an increase in employee reports, right? These reports that transit workers are making through the employee safety reporting program about threats of assaults from passengers. And it's a market increase, right? It's more than, than the agencies used to. And they dig in a little bit deeper into these reports and they find a pattern. And what they see is that in all of the instances of these increased uh, reports, they all seem to center around fair disputes and the challenge of fair enforcement for these agencies. Again, this is a hypothetical example at our fictional agency, Straight Line Transit. Now, because of this increase in these threats, these verbal threats, Straight Line decides that they wanna assess the safety risk associated with um, operators enforcing rules, including fair enforcement. And so they go to their safety risk register and they enter in a date, which is for them, it's the 1st of July, which is the date that they had this meeting. And they discussed this it's when they identified this hazard and they listed as the source, the employee safety reporting program, right? Where they got these reports showing this increase. Now also what Straight Line does is they review a number of the potential consequences associated with this hazard of, of rule enforcement, right? And this one that's listed on your screen might seem obvious, right? A transit worker is assaulted. Um, but they also consider other things before landing on this. They think about um, perhaps the threatening individual could damage the transit vehicle. Perhaps they could injure and harm other passengers. Perhaps they could distract the driver or impact them such that that they have a collision with another vehicle while they're operating. So, but at the end of all of this, they focus on the most likely consequence, which to the safety committee, they decide to focus on a transit worker being assaulted while they're operating the vehicle. Now, with the help of some of their subject matter experts and members from their operations department, they identify what mitigations do we already have in place that serve to address this hazard. And they identify, again, with the help of operations, some of these existing mitigation, things like um, operator assault awareness training that is being administered to, to operators. Um, things like their existing SOPs that define what operators do when operating their vehicles. And their rule book that's provided when this, the training is delivered, right? So these they define as, these are our existing mitigations that we have in place at our agency. And further, the group notices that straight line transit has already assessed in the past the risk associated with operators enforcing rules. And they did this several years ago, back in 2019. And at that time, 
the agency went through this formal safety risk assessment process and they came up with a safety risk rating. And at that time, they thought that the severity of this potential consequence of this assault was, was critical and that the likelihood was remote. And so they put those two things together to come up with a safety risk index of 2D. Now, Straight Line Transit decides that based on this new information, this emerging trend from our ESRP program, that they want to reassess the safety risk associated with this hazard and this potential consequence. So the agency takes a look at its safety risk assessment matrix. And again, this is an example matrix that Straight Line Transit uses. Your agency may have a completely different looking matrix, or maybe not even a matrix at all. It may have a different method. But this is what Straight Line uses. And in their reassessment, they decide that the severity is still critical for this, this uh, assault, but that the likelihood of it happening, and again, based on this increase in reports, is actually probable. And so they recode this instead of being 2D, they recode it to be 2B. And from there, right, the earlier example, if we think about was that 2D, and it landed it in this yellow region. And again, this is a matrix color code used by Straight Line Transit. Your agency may have a different approach. But with their reassessment, they noticed that now it's in an area of their risk index that they classify as unacceptable. And it's that, that ultimately means that this level of risk is higher than the accountable executive, the chief safety officer is, is, is willing to accept. So returning back to our safety risk register, straight line transit inputs, plugs in their new safety risk assessment information, right? their new index or rating. And again, since this is now representing a level that's unacceptable to the accountable executive, the safety department begins to consider potential mitigations to help move that level of, of safety risk to a level that is acceptable. And so the agency first considers hiring fair enforcement officers to help remove the duty of fair enforcement from their operators. That's one, one idea they came up with. They also thought about considering revising their existing rules and revising them such that they no longer require operators to refuse, refuse boarding to individuals that don't pay a fare. Right? They consider hiring additional security staff additional security guards that can provide ride-alongs on the transit vehicles right, to help provide an additional security presence. They also consider some other creative solutions like introducing piloting a program that would uh, involve contactless or off-board fare payment in order to reduce the contact with this fare processing that operators are currently dealing with. They think about providing some additional and some specific de-escalation training for their transit operators, All right? So they have a lot of ideas about ways in which they can address that safety risk. So in reviewing this and in conjunction with the accountable executive, the agency decides on two safety risk mitigations that they feel will help address the safety risk most effectively. The first is they're gonna provide de-escalation training to their operators. And second, they're gonna revise the agency's rules. And they're gonna do it so that they now will allow operators to board individuals who maybe have not or have refused to pay the fare. Now, to determine whether or not they're these selected, these chosen safety risk mitigations should reduce uh, the safety risk to a level that is now acceptable to leadership, the safety department decides to assess this projected safety risk, what they think it will look like after they've implemented these selected mitigations. And so they, they look at this matrix again, and they think that with these changes, it's not gonna address the severity of the assault, this potential assault that could happen, but they believe they will address the likelihood and they believe it would move it back to this remote likelihood level. And again, this is just what straight lines experts come up with in their review. 
And with that new classification, again, now it's in a level that is acceptable to straight line transit's leadership. Now, of course, the agency isn't done, right? We've, they've taken their um, SRM process, they've gone to the development of the safety risk mitigation. But now, of course, they have to implement the safety risk mitigations, make sure it's actually done, carried out at the agency. And so to do this, they go back to their safety risk register and their safety risk register is actually gonna capture more information about the implementation of their mitigation. And so what they do is they assign the training to their training coordinator and they set an estimated implementation date of August and they assign the rule revision to their CSO and they, and they assign that to occur by mid-September. Now, as with any safety risk mitigation, part of an agency's responsibility right under safety assurance is to monitor those mitigations. And one way that agencies can do it, and it's a way that Straight Line Transit chose to do it in our example, is to use performance indicators and to set performance targets to help the agency understand how well this mitigation is going, either how well it's being implemented or how effective it's been at addressing safety risk. And so let's just take a moment to remind ourselves, what do we monitor mitigations for? What is the rule, the PTAS regulation require transit agencies to monitor when it comes to mitigations? Well, as required in our regulation, it, uh, transit agencies are required to monitor the implementation of the mitigations, the appropriateness of the mitigation and its effectiveness. So let's go back to our safety risk register. Now to monitor uh, the implementation, the agency decides to, set, to use a performance indicator, right? The percent of operators trained, right? To look at this de-escalation training mitigation, it knows how, how well we know we've implemented this. Well, we can look at how many of our operators have been trained. And the agency actually sets a performance target, which will let them know whether or not they've implemented this as according to plan. And it's they're looking for 100% of operators trained over the next 45 calendar days. They document this right here in their safety risk register. Now for the second mitigation, revising the rules, they decide to set uh, a new indicator as the percent of relevant workers trained on the new rules. And they wanna make sure, excuse me, that they, they set the performance indicator to be that the rules are actually revised and published, and they set a target that those rules are revised and published within 45 days. And that's how they know how well they've implemented this new rule change. Okay, so they set a target of 45 days. Now, we also have to measure the effectiveness of our mitigations, right? How well are they solving this problem? How well are they addressing safety risk? And so to monitor the effectiveness the transit agency decides to look at operator feedback on the training itself. And it sets a target of this feedback as being greater than 90% of the operators agree that the training was effective. And to monitor the effectiveness of these revised rules, they set an indicator to be the number of operators that report being assaulted. And their target is zero reports of physical assaults over the next six months. Now, finally, to measure appropriateness, the agency decides to look at feedback on the training and the percentage of operators that agree that the training taught them how to de-escalate these situations. And for revising the rules, they set an indicator related to the number of operators that are reporting fair disputes on vehicles. And the target is over the next six months, we hope this new rule will allow us to see that there have been zero reports of fair disputes over that six month period. All right, so in this case, straight line transit, it's using its safety risk register and it's setting targets so that it will know how well it's implemented this mitigation, if it's been appropriate, if it was the right one and if, whether or not it's been effective. And to ensure implementation, Right? The safety risk register defines all of this, who's going to do each mitigation, when. But also, straight line transit decides to document the responsible party for the monitoring activities as well. 
So using its safety risk register, they define the responsible party for following up on the data related to these performance targets. And you can see how they've used their safety risk register to document this. And so what we've seen now, we've taken this from hazard identification all the way through to mitigation and monitoring whether or not these mitigations are performing the way we've intended them to perform. And at this point, what we want to do is to take a, a, a transition and hear from an industry speaker, Jared Garcia, and he's going to talk about a little bit about how at his agency they've handled SRM and SA activities. And I'm going to hand it first back over to Stuart. Stuart? Thanks, Andy. It was great to see that example. And now, uh, as, as you said, we'll um, introduce Jared to share some more examples. Um, we're really pleased to be joined today by Jared Garcia. Jared currently serves as manager of safety for uh, San Diego Metropolitan Transit System, or MTS. Jared's worked in the transportation industry for more than 25 years in both operations and safety roles. He holds a bachelor's degree in public administration from San Diego State University and the Transportation Safety and Security Program, or TSSP, certificate from the Transportation Safety Institute. Chair, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Uh, so just a little bit about our agency. Uh, we're a multimodal agency that uh, operates both light rail and bus service throughout 12 cities within San Diego County. Uh, we have six operating divisions, one for rail and five for bus. And we contract out about 50% of our fixed route bus service with TransDev. And we also contract out all of our paratransit service with First Transit. Uh, so uh, when we kind of go through our uh, process for going over our risk registry, uh, generally these uh, types of hazards come through one of four different uh, sources primarily through either accident investigation, uh, our employee safety committee, where we get most of them, uh, our employee reporting program, as well as our annual safety performance assessment. So one example um, that we have for our uh, risk registry example is uh, a hazard, if I can get the next slide, please. Um, is that we recently installed uh, barriers for our bus operators and um, this created a conflict with an existing policy that we have uh, where bus operators are supposed to uh, make a visible hand gesture or open uh, the barrier door uh, to prevent passengers from tripping over the wheelchair ramp as it's being deployed. So we identified this as being a hazard back in March of 2021 after we installed these new permanent barriers. And um, to kind of go into this a little bit further, we kind of have to take a step going back uh, quite a few years. So if I can get the next slide, please. Uh, so in 2018, we had looked at uh, the number of events we had where passengers were tripping over a wheelchair ramp as it was being deployed. And we noticed that for calendar year 2018, we had had 15 events, and of those, only one of them was determined to be non-preventable. So uh, if I get the next slide, if we, we went back to 2017, and saw that we had fewer events, 13, and of those 13, four were non-preventable. So in 2018, we had noticed that not only was there an increase in overall events, but there was a decrease in the events being non-preventable. So we went back and we looked at all of the videos and the circumstances around what was happening. And we also looked at our, our policy and how we were conducting our training for bus operators and uh, we determined that there was a need to uh, do more to warn passengers that the ramp was about to be deployed. So we implemented a new policy, if I get the next slide, please, uh, that operators had to make both an audible announcement and a visible hand gesture before deploying the wheelchair ramp. Uh, and with the change in policy, we made changes to 
uh, training our bus operators both uh, at the start of employment as well as we do eight hours of annual retraining for all bus operators. So we implemented that new training uh, in addition to the policy change. And in 2019, uh, we saw a slight decrease uh, to 12 events, and we saw an increase in the events being non-preventable. We continued uh, to monitor the situation and continued to do uh, the same type of training. And for events that were not considered non-preventable, we sent the operators back for retraining uh, to make sure that they correctly understood the new policy and requirements. Uh, so we went a year forward to 2020, and we continued to monitor the situation. Uh, in addition to that, we had the start of the pandemic, uh, which led to fewer passengers and fewer opportunities for passengers to trip over the wheelchair ramp. We also had, for a time, we were doing rear door boarding only, uh, until we installed a temporary germ barrier, which was basically a, a thin plexiglass um, that was attached with some um, hinges to, to the side of the bus. Um, so with that, uh, operators were no longer able to make a visible hand gesture because the germ barrier blocked uh, them from doing that. So we, again, went and looked at things and implemented a, a change in policy, and that meant that they had to open the barrier door. Uh, we went on to 2021, and we installed a new permanent barrier that was much more robust, and when operators tried to open that, they were unable to open the door and operate the lift at the same time. So we had to go back and look and see what we were going to do. So we, again, went and updated our policy to where a hand gesture was no longer visible uh, or required, uh, only an audible warning. And so we decided that we need to do some sort of design change. So we did a design change where we have pre-programmed uh, an announcement that's tied to the power of the wheelchair ramp. Um, to warn passengers. So we've taken some of the responsibility away from the operators and put it on this uh, automatic announcement. So if we go to the next slide, can show kind of a picture of, of what that is. So now when operators are deploying the wheelchair ramp, uh, there's an automatic announcement as well as a visual message that's on the, the internal destination sign to warn passengers uh, that the wheelchair ramp is deploying. Uh, so we have just kind of implemented this in the last month or so, and we're still kind of going through the testing phase of, of this new uh, programming, this new mitigation. Thanks. Jared, thank you so much. Appreciate you sharing your experience in that example of how your agency took that through SRM and SA. And um, what we'd like to do now is to continue this discussion and talk about how we track safety concerns, right? And thinking about safe, what is a safety concern? And, and as we all know, transit agencies could identify an innumerable amount of safety concerns. So based on your agency's size, based on the complexity of your agency, importantly, based on the resources available to your agency, you may not be able to, or you may not be interested in tracking every single safety concern, depending on that concern. Some agencies have used a process, and we've seen this in some of the agency safety plans that have been submitted voluntarily to FTA for review, but the establishment of some thresholds um, for example, only tracking concerns that rise above a specific level or some criteria. Now, agencies may decide that some safety concerns are beyond their control, right? Their realm of control. And so they won't warrant more follow up with the agency. And so they might decide not to track those types of safety concerns, right? They might think that other safety concerns aren't really relevant to their transit operations. So they they won't track those, but 
you know, it's really up to each agency to identify how it's going to um, kind of set that boundary around what concerns it's going to track. Now, also, it's important to note that some agencies will track safety concerns outside of a safety risk register, right? And I'm talking about agencies that maybe use a safety risk register. But there might be situations in which information about that concern lives outside of the safety risk register. And we can think about places like perhaps it, it lives within a maintenance record database, or perhaps it lives in inspection reports or internal audit reports that the agency has, and maybe related data stores. Perhaps it, it lives within um, databases or a data store related to the employee safety reporting program. So this information may, if you use a safety risk register, you still may manage data outside of that register related to the concerns. Now, one more opportunity that a safety risk register can offer a transit agency is a place where you can document leadership's decision-making on a specific topic. So for example, we were talking about straight line transit in this assault hazard, this worker assault example. And what we can see on, on the screen now is in their safety risk register where they've documented the agency's approval. And we can see where the, the CSO has signed off in the accountable executive and also when and where that that approval occurred. So again, all of this information kind of throughout that SRM and SA process, straight lines actually documenting it in this one location in their safety risk register. And just another reminder, back to our caveat, our example that we've used today and this method of a safety risk register is really just, just one way to, to address these requirements. And the way that we've used the safety risk register is really just one way in which you can use a safety risk register. And, you know, the important thing is that the PTAS regulation does establish some requirements that we have to document the outputs, the results of these SMS activities. So the results of our SA activities, the results of our SRM activities, how your agency chooses to address those documentation requirements is up to you but the safety risk register may prove a very effective and valuable way in which your agency can meet those requirements. And of course, if you choose to implement a safety risk register, perhaps your use might be more detailed than our example today, or maybe it's a simpler approach with less detail. Again, how you do it is gonna be up to each agency. And with that, I'm actually gonna turn the microphone back over to Stuart to talk to us about our survey process for today. Stuart. Thanks, Andy. We want to encourage everybody uh, one, one more time before we uh, begin our Q&A portion of uh, the webinar. We just want to encourage you again, when you see the survey, uh, as you exit the webinar after Q&A to complete the survey, again, your feedback helps improve, helps us improve and provide technical assistance that's tailored to your needs. And I just want to spend a, a minute uh, summarizing some of the things we've heard today and pointing some to some resources that are in the TAC library that may be uh, relevant to you. So our webinar today focused on advanced topics in safety risk management and safety assurance. And if you'd like more background information or a refresher on either the SRM or SA process, we encourage you to visit the FTA's PTAS TAC resource library for more webinars, uh, webinar recordings and slides, tools, fact sheets that are related to SRM and SA. That library can be found at transit.dot.gov forward slash PTAS dash TAC. And we also want to remind you that uh, you may have, if you have questions that are related to the bipartisan infrastructure law, you can get more information uh, on FTA's dedicated website at uh, transit.dot.gov slash BIL. And of course, if you have questions, um, you can send those questions to FTA-IIJA at DOT.gov. And uh, just in case you haven't visited the PTAS PAC website recently, I uh, want to point out how you can find resources, uh, some of the resources that I've just mentioned. Uh, so when you visit transit.dot.gov slash PTAS dash TAC, uh, you'll see a directory uh, on your screen that says PTAS Resource Library, and there are entryways into the content organized by agency. So for instance, if you're a bus transit provider and you uh, head in that way, you'll see a listing of materials and resources that are specifically relevant to bus transit providers. If you select, for instance, a safety risk management 
uh, link, you'll see some tools, uh, and I want to call it a couple in particular that are especially relevant to the topic of today's webinar. One is a sample safety risk assessment matrices for bus transit agencies. Uh, there's a guide to those matrices, and there's also a sample safety risk register. So if you want to take a look at an example of how, how a safety risk register is structured, you can uh, get that from the resource library. Uh, I also want to point out uh, our April webinar on safety risk assessment. The presentation and slides from that webinar are also available in the resource library, along with a webinar uh, from last year on implementing safety risk assessment approaches. That's available in the library as well. And the TAC also continues to operate our help desk to assist the transit industry to assist you with uh, PTAF questions, including questions about ASP development, implementation, ongoing implementation of SMS activities and processes, as well as uh, evaluation, uh, audit, and oversight. The help desk is available by phone at 877-827-7243 from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, and via email at ptas-tac at dot gov.